Today, I'm here to talk you through making your own peated whiskey at home. Exciting, I know, we're talking grain selection, recipe, mashing, fermenting, distilling, blending, cutting, uh, wood aging, and of course, then tasting the finished product, which I have right here. How's it going, chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse, and this is still at the channel all about chasing the craft of home distillation and making it a legitimate hobby. We do stuff just like making our own peated whiskey around here. Regular viewers of the channel will know that I have been making my own peated whiskey over the last few weeks. Today I want to take you all the way from the beginning to the end of that process so you can adjust it for what you want specifically and uh, you can end up with your own peated whiskey at home as well. Don't worry, we're going to get into the pretty b-roll practical doing things stuff real soon but first I want to have a talk about how peaty this recipe is going to be and whether or not you're going to like it. So to talk about that, I've got a wee bit of a scale. It's not exact, yes it, you may disagree with me, but it's a rough scale to give you an idea of how this works. I've got three commercial bottles here that I think for me sort of go from not so peaty up to most peaty and then you know something like Optimal would sit way up over this side over here. <clears throat> and the reason I want to show you this is I think the recipe that I've made with this malt, the specific malt, sits right around here. It's not quite as crazy ashy peaty as Laphroaig 10, but it's more so than these bottles, okay? If you can get your hands on these bottles or you've already tried them, this is going to give you an idea, right? Go out and buy the cheapest bottle of Laphroaig you can get, um, you know, whether it be the 10 or the Select, whatever you can get hold of easily, and try it. Do you love the amount of peat that's in that? Do you love the smoke? Do you love the ash? Do you love the iodine? Do you want more of that? If the answer to that is yes, make the recipe exactly as you're about to see it. If the answer to that is no, you don't want that smoke, but you do still want to play with smoke, all you need to do is sub out some of the peated malt that I'm going to use and switch it for a unpeated base malt. Now, if you don't know exactly what that is and what examples you could use, I'll leave some links down in the description below uh, for specific examples you could use, okay? The exact percentage that you switch out, do you take 50% of the peated malt and turn it into Golden Promise? Maybe. I can't tell you that. You're going to have to make a decision based on, you know, do I want half as much peat as this? It's not necessarily a linear thing. You're just going to have to try what works for you. All right, that's enough of that. Let's get into making some shit. <laughs> All right, team, the first decision you have is which malt you're going to use. I'm using a special malt that is grown, malted, and smoked here in New Zealand by Gladfields. It's smoked with Pete's literally dug out of the ground in New Zealand too, which is pretty freaking cool for us. If you're not in New Zealand, you're not going to be able to get this. If you can't get it, that's cool. Once again, I'll leave you some specific links in the description down below of things you could switch it to, but something like Thomas Fawcett's Heavily Peated will do just fine. Oh, I've got a little fantail friend that keeps chirping over there. <laughs> it's actually pretty cool. I'm actually going to use 25 kilos of this stuff, a full sack, and that's because simply because I have it and I want to use it. I want to get the stuff in the pipeline, but I don't have a large enough mash tun to make that happen in one go, which means I'm doing three 8.3 kilo mashes with about six gallons of water in each. So feel free to scale this recipe up or down depending on the size of the mash tun you have. Regardless, the first thing we need to do is crush that grain, mill that grain. Let's get stuck in. I actually mashed three separate mashes of 8.3 kilos of grain, 23 liters of water and mashed for one hour at 65 degrees Celsius. Now I did this over three days to make my yeast go a little bit further. You can watch more about that with the card up top. Now, if you don't want to do that and you have the mash tun space and the time, of course you can do it all in one day. So I'm going to let this sit for an hour to mash. And while I do, let's talk about yeast. What I need to do now is uh, start hydrating this yeast. So please understand that this is not a yeast starter. I am not growing yeast here. I am just making it, um, I'm just ensuring that less yeast will die when we pitch it into the wort, right? So that is just water. 
24 degrees Celsius, water, nothing else. Uh, and I'm not going to stir it, I'm just going to leave it like that. I know that's horribly scientific, but that's, um, that's what we're using. I'm going to seal this up and whack it in the Ziploc bag back in the fridge for use another day. Why am I using the two yeasts? Well, I want the O4 for the flavor. I want to create some crazy esters. I want to kind of tropical it up a little bit. I want to fruity it up. And I'm hoping that uh, this is going to get me there. That's the plan. This stuff is a relatively neutral yeast, apparently. I've never used it before. If you guys have, let me know. Uh, but what it is designed to do is to ferment out higher gravity. So I'm going to use this to dry it up at the end. And I could multi-stage pitch this, yes I know, but eh. <laughs> I'm just going to leave that there, I'm going to let it chill, and when it comes time to pitch, it's going to be beautiful and creamy. After mashing for an hour, it's time to spudge. Obviously your equipment's going to handle this in different ways, but I lift my grain bed up and spudge to around about 30 litres. Now you have a choice. Do you want to raise the temperature to 90 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes to pasteurise things and ensure the only yeast that is fermenting this wort is the yeast we pitch? Or do you want to let some funky stuff from the grain survive, throw off some acids for esterification later on in the still and fruity things up a little bit? Now that's up to you. I actually did both. There's more on that in the video that I linked just a little bit earlier. But either way, chill the wet back down to pitching temperature and pitch your yeast. Ferment between 22 and 27 degrees Celsius. This took me around about a week to get a stable hydrometer reading over a few days. Funnily enough, this actually fermented out really dry. Your final gravity might differ a little. I wouldn't worry about it too much as long as it's under about 1010. I then took half the wash, around about 40 litres, added it into the still and performed what we call a stripping run, which is essentially there to cut the volume down significantly. If you would like to know more about my still choice and the type of still I use to run this, please click the card up the top. I've got a whole other video on that. With the low wines collected, I can drain the boiler out, add the low wines back in along with the rest of the wash and get ready for the spirit run. The spirit run was performed with a low, slow, straight pot still. For a new spirit that I haven't made before, I always collect into individual jars, set them aside throughout the run, and that way I don't have to decide when to make cuts during distillation. I can come back a little bit later on when my palette's nice and clear, and just exactly what I want to keep and what I don't want to keep later on. The next day I came back and assessed each jar individually to decide what was going to make the cut and what wasn't. Essentially what I was looking for is much flavours that I liked and enjoyed, including the big peaty flavours, while discarding the heads, which are the acetony, nail polishy, nasty, weird, prickly stuff, and the tails, which is the kind of cementy, wet dog, wet cardboard flavours that you definitely don't want in there either. So now that I've decided on exactly what makes the cut, uh, I need to decide what I'm going to age this stuff on. So this is charred US white oak that has already been used in a bourbon, which is really similar to what, um, you know, the, the Isla guys tend to use most of the time, right? But I also have something else that's kind of special to stick with the New Zealand theme. This is Pahutakawa wood that was sent in by one of the viewers. Thank you so much, dude. I toasted it in the oven for an hour and a half at 180 degrees, and then I gave it a really good char, long, slow char with a blowtorch as well. Now, what I want to do is do a quick force age with both of these, with an example of both of these, to get an idea of what each of these woods is going to potentially do. To force age, I take a sample of the spirits, put it into an airtight jar with the wood, and put it through a series of cycles of hot and cold using the freezer and warm tap water. Before we get into tasting this stuff and letting you know what it's like, I need to say a huge thank you to these guys here. These are the Patreons, uh, the ones that directly support this channel and allow me to keep making content like this and actually at the moment, make even more content than I ever have before. So thank you so much, guys. If you find value in these videos and you think you'd like to help out, please jump on over to Patreon, have a look at the different tiers, see if there's something right for you, and uh, if there is, you can sign up.
So after about six days of doing the hot cold cycles and then another four or five days just to sit and chill, we've got these two examples. So this is the Pahutakawa and this is the second hand oak, uh, which I'm guessing you probably could have guessed by the, the difference in color. So on the nose, this is pretty much what we could expect, right? There's a lot more wood sugar and straight up wood flavor in this, obviously, because it hasn't been sapped out by the spirit that was in here before. Much more reminiscent of bourbon or an American whiskey. Uh, being Pahutakawa, it's obviously different than oak. And I'm getting less of the straight up barrel candy that I would get with white oak. Less of the caramel, vanilla, a touch of herbiness. There's no sappiness. There's no sappiness or sawdustiness, which is really interesting. I need to get to know Pahutakawa more. And obviously this is not the product to do that because there is so much smoke and crazy funkiness going on from the spirit in there as well. This is much more like a traditional Isla spirit. The wood isn't giving, you know, any large sweet flavors. It's just giving a roundness to the nose, which isn't there on the new make spirit. More like honeysuckle, maybe a touch of heading towards honey, but not really there. Hmm, interesting. All right. Yeah, so there's very little influence from the wood on this yet. I think that needs a lot more time. Funnily enough, than the, uh, the wood that hasn't been used yet. Mm. But it does allow the spirit to shine. Uh, what I do get in this still is a little bit of green grassiness in this spirit. Over here, mm. much larger, fuller, more backbone to it with sugar, body. No tannin or spice yet, which is interesting. I like that actually in this spirit. And it's filling out that rounder underside of the raisiny plummy. And this is almost heading a little bit towards sort of chocolate and fig. Uh, actually, why don't we just do this too? That is better than both of them by themselves. 100% better than both of them by themselves. What does this little exercise tell me? It tells me that yes, the Pahutakawa does actually work with the spirit. So I'm not taking a huge gamble using something I've never used before. Uh, it does tell me that yes, that the spirit will react nicely to secondhand oak. All right, so I think what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to split the new make into three different versions. Now, two of those I'm going to keep a little bit smaller, and the last one I'm going to use a larger volume of it. The first one, I'm literally going to take this piece of wood out of the speed aging and use that. So it's going to be like almost second use Pahutakawa. Uh, the second one, I'm going to do actually new charred and toasted Pahutakawa. And the third one, which will be the large volume, sort of almost two to one of those other two, is uh, the second hand US white oak. That's my plan. I definitely feel like the yeast choice and letting it go a little bit wild and letting it get a little sour with the wild yeast has helped out. I'm getting some really fun fruity esters that I've not had a lot of in my products before. So that's really cool. But they very much take a back seat to the, the peat side of things. Once again, not a huge amount of smoke, straight up smoke, but a lot of ashtray, ash, char, Funky stuff like that happening. I can't wait to spend a little bit more time with the spirit, let it age out further uh, and see what it's going to turn into, guys. I really can't. All right, guys, if you've already made your own peated whiskey at home, I would love to hear from you, especially in terms of those ratios of peat, right? How much peated malt did you use versus sort of how that ended up sitting on a commercial spectrum? It's something we can all talk about together. And if you do get around to trying your own peated malt because of this, please, please, please come back and let me know how it went. Anyway, guys, I hope you've had as much fun watching this as I've had uh, making it or drinking it, especially. <laughs> If you did like this video and you'd like to see more like it, please guys hit the subscribe button down below, give it a thumbs up, and I will see you guys next time. Keep on chasing the craft. See ya.